Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from the OrthoClips podcast series, and today I'm with Dr. Joseph Thoder, professor of orthopedic surgery at Temple University Hospital, and we're going to be talking about distal radius fractures, top five management tips. Thanks, Dr. Thoder, for being with me. Thank you, Saqib, for inviting me. So we'll get right into it. Um, what are your, what, well, what's your first tip for those uh, surgeons taking care of distal radius fractures? I think first and foremost is patient selection. Over the course of the last 30 years of my experience in orthopedics, the pendulum has swung from the concept that distal radius is, couldn't be fixed or shouldn't be fixed to now a peak when all of them were fixed, now back to appropriate, in my opinion, patient selection. So there are patient populations where the criteria for a fracture that would be amenable to internal fixation doesn't apply to the, necessarily the patient personality, not just the fracture personality. By that I mean the severely comminuted distal radius fracture in an elderly patient may better be served by an external fixator to hold it out to length and heal metaphyseal fractures that are non-articular in elderly patients do pretty well if you look at how they did compared to their cohorts who are operated on and there is no surgical risk, no infection risk, et cetera, for non-operative treatment. Close reduction, if you have the facilities to do so, if you have access to regional anesthesia or um, hematoma block or beer block, something that can be done in the urgent setting to perform that reduction is frequently all a significant patient population needs. So don't take unnecessary risks in, in fractures that are otherwise relatively stable that will do well in the long term in the right, right correctly select, selected patients. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for open reduction. And obviously, the technology that has evolved over the last 20 years has made it so that we can really perform anatomic reductions and achieve superior outcomes uh, to what it was prior to the advent of that technology. So yeah, patient selection, and I'm sure you can think of lots of examples where that wasn't followed and ended up maybe not being the best choice for that patient. So after patient selection, what would you say is your second uh, tip? Next is the fracture's personality. You know, there is a historical bent to call all distal radius fractures Collies fractures. Uh, who knows even what the definition of a Collies fracture is, but certainly they're not all Collies fractures. There are high energy fractures, low energy fractures, fractures that are intraarticular. There are certain patterns of the intraarticular components that are some to some degree predictable. And then there are the sort of the nuanced fractures, the volar shear fractures, the fractures which on the volar aspect uh, demonstrate a disruption of the lunate facet that carry with it different things you need to pay attention to in terms of how you're going to go about fixing it and whether or not internal fixation alone is enough. Does it need supplemental external fixation? Does it need a supplemental bridge plate? Um, and I think that's a circumstance where there's no such thing as too much information. If there's any doubt about what the fracture pattern or personality looks like, I think CT scanning with 3D reconstructions is a great way to become familiar with what you're dealing with, sort of give your, your mind a three-dimensional view of where your hardware is going to go, how you're going to get there. Um, and the that sort of segues into my uh, third point, which would be your surgical plan and having options in the room so that if plan A doesn't work, you can go to plan B. By that, I mean if you think something is amenable to a volar plate alone and it isn't and you need supplemental fixation either from the radial side or from the dorsal side, then whatever equipment you have needs to enable you to be able to do that. There are lots of systems out there. There are uh, periarticular variations of things that fit the dorsal cortex better, that fit the radial cortex for radial sided plating, which at times is necessary to add that lateral stability for the radial shear fractures. So the fracture personality leads you to surgical planning. And I think that the more you know beforehand, the better off you'll be. Uh, in addition to that, 
much like we learned about the distal tibia and intraarticular fractures there, that there are multiple places where you can go to put your fixation that will give you the best fixation of the fragment. So that if you're gonna put fragment back to a construct that you're building on a bone standpoint, you can put the hardware radially, you can put the hardware dorsally, you can put the hardware volarly. You may have to go all three places, but you have an idea where to go to recreate the articular surface and realign things. So the volar plate isn't always the answer. It's often the answer, but you have to be suspicious of things. And I think the things that tip you off to that are an appropriate evaluation of the lateral projection to be sure that the volar lip is not a separate piece and, and subluxed with the uh, remaining portion of the carpus. That the radial shear fracture isn't such that a volar plate will only have one peg or screw capturing it. So you're really not fixing it from the volar side. You're kind of hanging on to it with a screw that's in metaphyseal bone. And dorsal hardware gets a very bad reputation because of what happened to it when we tried to fix that way with larger hardware in places where there wasn't enough space for the hardware with tendon ruptures and extensor tendon adhesions, some, some of them being significant complications to that patient's care. But if the fracture needs that to be fixed, there is lower profile hardware now, there's, there's pin plate constructs, there are things that can be used that should be used in my opinion if you have a large dorsal shear fracture, fixing that from the volar side again. You're, you don't want your major fracture fragment that you're trying to address hanging on the back end of threads or pegs. So, you know, I'm familiar that there are some of these uh, kits um, that have kind of like a prepackaged kit with like a volar plate, for instance, and a certain number of screws and a uh, little disposable screwdriver, for instance. Um, so it sounds to me like if you really rely on that all the time, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to flex and... Uh, you know, be able to address other situations. I don't know if, if, if that's the type of thing you use or we don't have to get proprietary, but it seems to me like that could get you into a hole sometimes, I guess. Yes, you know, that, then, then you end up trying to make what you do fit what you have rather than using what, what you need to fix what you have. That's right, okay. Um, so what's your uh, fourth management tip for distal radius fractures? They need, whether it's self-directed or formal uh, therap therapy input, the most important thing is the hand rehab. You know, the, the concept that the hand is the tool and the shoulder, elbow, and wrists are what put the tool in space so the patient can use the tool. If the tool is hampered by stiffness or uh, nerve symptoms or things that are resultant from the injury, and they're ignored early on, it's difficult to get that back. I would argue with you that it's much more important for a patient after a distal radius fracture to have full flexibility in their fingers in terms of finger motion than it is for them to have wrist motion. So I think the early rehab is to be respected, but it needs to concentrate on the hand. Patients will frequently come back with their hands swollen more than you think and that may already be too late to, to intervene. The patient's personality, as we all know, sometimes plays a big factor in how that rehab goes and into part of the decision-making as to whether you're gonna leave them to their own devices with something you instruct them to or have them go to a hand therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, whatever it may be, so they get the appropriate guidance and somebody's measuring what they're doing so you have a better uh, grasp on what's happening. With regard to the wrist, I think the motion pairs of pronation and supination are much more of a functional consideration than flexion and extension. And that if back to the fracture personality, et cetera, if you haven't restored it to the appropriate position, then you're going to affect the distal radial ulnar joints geometry and affect pronation and supination. So fixing it in that position isn't enough. You have to make sure they maintain or regain that motion from a functional standpoint. So the tool has to work. You have to be able to pronate and supinate the, the hand and arm 
for optimal function. And flexion extension, although important, is the least important of the things that, that need to be rehabilitated in terms of the global concept of what's that function going to look like later. All right, great. Yeah, it's important uh, to really focus on what matters in rehab. So that leads us to our uh, last management tip. What's number five for you? The controversy of what to do with the median nerve. Um, we often read about it. People often write about it that you know the acute carpal tunnel syndrome, if you will, at the time of distal radius fracture requires surgical intervention. In reality, if you look at the number of distal radius fractures that occur, the time that there's an acute median neuropathy is rare. Um, most of the time, patients will have, I'm talking about your routine fractures, not you know, the high energy fractures. You're going to be doing something to them anyway. It's almost, it's almost a prophylactic thing to decompress their median nerve because they're going to get a problem if they don't have it acutely. But the, the patient who has carpal tunnel syndrome after distal radius fracture that you see back at three or four days. I think things that are important to know are, did they have any carpal tunnel symptoms prior to? They're often not asked, so that may not be in their ER record, that may have been asked to the person who uh, saw them before you did if it was referred to you. So you need to have a handle on well, what was that baseline. If they had no symptoms before and they now have symptoms, that should raise a red flag for you to at least watch it closely. If they have had off and on median nerve symptoms, that's often going to be a transient phenomenon. So that if the patient doesn't require surgery for the fracture, you can observe the median nerve symptoms. You can even treat them with steroid injections to try to um, affect the severity of symptoms, just like you would for a patient who comes in with a median nerve complaint without a distal radius fracture. And I think the median nerve should be treated surgically the same way you would treat it without a fracture involved in, outside the high energy, dense median neuropathy kind of thing that, that really shouldn't be controversial. All right, great. So I guess I'm going to summarize in my mind, sounds like that a first management tip is you know, appropriate patient selection. Second tip is uh, understanding the fracture personality, which leads into the third tip, which is developing an appropriate surgical plan based on those two things and realizing uh, your options and uh, the fact that you can access the distal radius from so many different uh, intervals. Uh, and then number four was uh, making sure your uh, rehab focuses on, focuses on the hand as well as uh, form rotation with wrist uh, flexion and extension being the uh, lowest uh, priority. And then the, f the fifth one was um, uh, making sure that we don't forget about the median nerve and paying attention to what uh, needs to be uh, done with the median nerve uh, in the context of the fracture. Does that sound about right? I think so, and I think that that's, if you keep those things in mind, you'll have successful outcomes more often than not. All right, great. Well, I think that wraps it up. We're about out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thoder, for speaking with me. My pleasure.